A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a brother who ministers here in the valley on staff at a church, and he and I were just sort of rapping a little bit about our experience in seminary. We had graduated together in 2021, and so we were just reflecting on some of the pressures and anxieties that are related to being in seminary. Some silly things like wondering if the professor has any favorite students, and then some more substantial things like dealing with the uncertainty of what the future of ministry is going to look like beyond graduation. Feeling like an imposter, like you're not as competent or gifted as others' students are. Recurring questions like, am I really called to do this? Do I have what it takes to be a pastor or a ministry leader? What's it gonna look like for me to follow Jesus in ministry after I'm done here? I'd like to serve you tonight by drawing your attention to the final chapter of John's gospel. And I believe it contains some helpful guidance that I trust the Holy Spirit will use to be able to encourage and strengthen us tonight as it relates to some of these recurring, nagging anxieties. So here's the plan. We're gonna walk through this chapter and we're gonna take note of five exhortations. Five exhortations related to following Jesus in ministry. That's the plan. Let's pray before we begin. Father, we do pray that you would help us to focus our hearts and minds, that we would be able to leave here encouraged and strengthened by your word, remembering that your faithfulness is great, that your mercy is more, and that you provide all that we need. We love you. We ask for your help by the Holy Spirit here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to draw your attention, if you have John's gospel open, to the very beginning of chapter 21. I'm not going to read it in its fullness, but the first exhortation that I'd like to draw to your attention is this, and this comes from verses 1 through 14 at the beginning of this chapter. Follow Jesus in obedience to his word. So this whole closing scene here in this last chapter takes place sometime during those 40 days between when Jesus resurrected and when he ascended. He's already appeared to his disciples a few times after his resurrection by this point, and they're soon going to be sent out to minister to the word by the power of the Spirit. And this closing chapter of John's gospel has some really important reminders that they're going to need to keep in mind as they begin that mission. As you know, some of the apostles were professional fishermen, And so apparently they've gone back home to Galilee, and Peter, who usually acted as the the lead among the equals there, decided that he was going to go fish. And six other disciples decided that they would follow him. And they went out night fishing in the sea that they're used to fishing. This is their home turf. Uh, You can see that in the text in verse 3. If you have your copy out in front of you, they went night fishing. Apparently that's when they would typically fish. You can catch them overnight and then sell them fresh in the morning. But notice what happened. It says that they caught nothing. Well, just as the dark of night was giving way to the light of day, someone shouted from the shore to them, hey kids, did you catch anything? It was about a football field away, so they couldn't, they couldn't make out who it was that was speaking to them, and so they responded, nope, nothing. And so the man on shore gave them a clear direction to throw their net out on the right side of the boat. And when they obeyed his word, the net was so full of fish that they could hardly haul it back into the boat. And as soon as that happened, John recognized, based on this miraculous haul of fish, he recognized who this fishing coach was. It was none other than Jesus himself. And so John recognizes this, he turns and he tells Peter, and Peter, being Peter, jumps right into the sea And he swims out after Jesus, and he swims to shore. The other disciples remained in the boat, reached there a little bit later. And when they all got there, they saw that Jesus was already there waiting for them, and he had prepared a meal for them, a meal of fish and bread on a charcoal fire. So it turns out that they caught 153 fish, way more than the net should have been able to hold, but it didn't break. This whole episode from verses 1 through 14 here is an illustration of a principle that Jesus has previously taught them in this gospel. He told them in John 15, 5, whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. He told his disciples that if they keep his commandments, they will be able to abide in his love and their joy would be full. And now we're seeing this sort of being played out in a narrative form, this principle being played out on the Sea of Galilee. Remember, these are skilled fishermen. They're they're professionals. Uh, This is what they did for a living. And yet here they are on this sea that they know so well at prime time, and yet they caught nothing. Verse 3, they can do nothing. But when they acted in obedience to his instruction, they hauled in so many fish that they could hardly fit into the boat. So by providing this abundance of fish, Jesus was showing that he would be able to be trusted for providing all of their needs. But I want to suggest that there's more happening here. Uh, We see in Matthew's gospel that Jesus told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men. And in the passage just before this, in John's gospel, Jesus told his disciples that he would send them out into the world with the word in the same way that the Father had sent him into the world with the word as the word. So I think, I think we're on solid ground here when we say that this hall of fish could be symbolic of the hall of converts that Peter and the others would soon be pulling in at Pentecost simply through the powerful proclamation of God's word. Jesus wanted to make sure that his apostles remembered that apart from him, they could do nothing. But as they obeyed his word, they would enjoy a huge haul of men and women who would be brought into God's kingdom by responding to his word in repentance and faith. The first exhortation, follow in obedience to his word, because apart from him, we, you and I, friends, can do nothing. We're going to consistently need this reminder in ministry because we gravitate towards our own knowledge, uh, our own strengths, our own experience, our own energy, our own plans, our own programs. But we've got to trust the power of the word and we've got to trust in Christ's provision for us. He will give us what we need when we need it. Uh, You won't be working effectively in ministry for very long, friends, if you are not convinced that the word will do the work that he wants it to do. One commentator said, serving Christ in our own strength is like going after Moby Dick with a pickle fork. I like the imagery. Uh, Step one for preparing for ministry is coming to terms with your own inability and embracing your dependence upon the sword of the spirit and a humble submission to the fact that Jesus ultimately is sovereign over the hall of fish. We must trust his timing and his purposes because he knows better than we do. So Peter jumped right into that sea to chase after Jesus as soon as he figured out who it was. Why would he do that? Why would Peter do that? Even after he has failed Jesus so publicly, so miserably, Why would he leap out there, throw himself into the sea to get to Jesus as soon as possible? Well, because he loved Jesus and he knew that Jesus was gracious. A second exhortation, follow Jesus in response to his grace. From verses 15 through 17, let me just read that once more back into our hearing. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Uh, There's some confusion about what Jesus is asking about with that first question. Simon, do you love me more than these? These what? What's these? Well, it seems best to me to read that as a question comparing his love to the other disciples. Do you love me more than these other disciples? And remember, during the Last Supper, Peter declared that he was ready to die for Jesus. 
in the garden of Gethsemane, he swung a sword to try to protect Jesus. And just moments ago, he was the one disciple who was willing to leap out of the boat into the sea after Jesus. And so it seems Jesus is asking Peter, do you, do you love me more than these disciples do? Back in verse nine, we got a passing reference to a charcoal fire in verse nine. Do you see that there? Jesus was sitting by that fire as he welcomed the disciples to shore. And that word underneath our translation of charcoal fire shows up only twice in the New Testament, both in John's gospel. The first time was on the night when Jesus was betrayed, when Peter stood warming himself by a charcoal fire as he publicly denied Jesus three times. And now as a a new day is dawning, Jesus invites him to share in a meal with him around this charcoal fire. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times in an expression of fear, Jesus now is inviting him to embrace him three times in an expression of his surpassing love. Jesus and Peter are using different Greek words here for love. ESV translates them all with love, and I think that's great. It's probably best. I don't want to read too much into uh, the meaning of those different words. But notice by the third time that Jesus asks him if he loves him, Peter is grieved. He says he's sad. He's sorrowful about this. Why? Why would Peter be sad by that question? Surely by that third time, it would begin to dawn on Peter what was, what was happening, what Jesus was doing. He's picking up on the eerie similarity of what happened last time he was around a charcoal fire. The third affirmation was a reminder of his three previous denials. No doubt it was a tender spot for Peter. He's all too familiar with his own weaknesses the way that he failed to live up to all those claims about loving the Lord and being ready to die for him and his dedication. But Jesus brings him grace, even in this bruising question that he asks him now for the third time, do you love me? One 20th century Methodist missionary said it like this, you ask me what forgiveness means, it is the wonder of being trusted again by God in the place where I disgraced him. Specific forgiveness at the very point of failure. We have seen Peter throughout John's gospel acting over and over again out of his own confidence, of his own flesh, his own ability, his own strength. But what he needs to be vigilant against are his points of weakness. Jesus, so in, in this gracious yet very pointed interaction with Peter, He's helping him realize that he needs to be held up by Jesus' strength and not his own. To minister in a healthy way, we must follow Jesus in response to his grace. Sometimes that grace, when it pierces our most vulnerable spots, those points of failure, it touches a nerve. I know that it does for me. I know that reaction well in my own heart. It wants to draw back in sadness, shame. In my battles against sin and selfishness, honestly, I would rather sort of just move over and through confession as quickly as possible. How specific do you get in your confession before the Lord? Are you content to sort of just lump it all up under a category of brokenness and leave it on his doorstep and ring the doorbell and leave? Maybe you've got a particular area of failure where you've become a little hopeless here tonight, maybe a little despondent, beginning to wonder if real growth or change is ever even possible because you keep failing again over and over again at this very same point. So here's the question, are you willing to let Jesus press in even when it's uncomfortable? The 16th century Puritan, Richard Sibbs, put it like this in his wonderful book, The Bruise Read. Since there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us, there can be no danger in thorough dealing. 
It's better to go bruised to heaven than sound to hell. As your friends, what might happen if you sat with Jesus around the fire long enough to let him tenderly and directly address you in your sin in its fullness? Genuinely trusting that he is gracious, believing that his desire isn't simply to push you further into your shame, but to keep you from treating your own willpower as the object of your faith, convinced that the deeper your sin is exposed, the further his mercy will travel. There's a lot of encouragement to be gained in Peter's example. Knowing that there is really only one hero in Christianity and that it's none of us, it's really encouraging. If we embrace that reality, it should really free us up to be able to come to Jesus with a little more clarity, a little more honesty, maybe a little more regularity. If you think that you need to have it all together constantly for Jesus, then you've misconceived what Christianity is. And that misconception is simply going to prevent you from persevering in ministry. It is the forgiveness of God in Christ that motivates our steps as we follow him in obedience, trusting that he won't turn his back on you and that you're always welcome to jump out and swim to Jesus. If you'd like to pray for some, with someone about a specific thing after the service is done, we'll have an opportunity to do that. I'd be happy to pray with you. A number of the faculty would be happy to as well. Did you notice in this interaction between Jesus and Peter what Jesus says our love for him ought to result in? This is a third exhortation. Follow Jesus in tending his sheep. From the same section, verses 15, 16, and 17. Each time Peter reaffirms his love for Jesus, he is instructing him to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. So it seems that Jesus expects to see some evidence of our love for him in the way that we treat his other sheep. Now, Peter obviously had a unique role to play here as an apostle. He was responsible to take what Jesus had fed him and then turn around and feed that to others. And not with fish, but with scripture and doctrine. Peter is being recommissioned now for the task of testifying to Jesus in the world in his absence by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to, to go out and build up the church upon the right confession of the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, who he is and why he came. And that's what he's doing all through his ministry and his sermons in the book of Acts. This is what Peter is all about. And if you read his letters that he wrote for the sake of these other sheep, this is exactly what he's doing. First and second Peter are marked by promoting sound doctrine, feeding the sheep and also protecting from false doctrine because Jesus's sheep must feed on Jesus's words of life. This is how Peter would feed the sheep with, with scripture and with doctrine. Uh, ministry is all about following Jesus in tending his sheep. Uh, none of us is going to write any portion of the New Testament, uh, but many of us, Lord willing, will be pastors, teachers, and ministers. So what are the implications of this instruction that Jesus gave to Peter for you to tend his lambs and sheep? Well, first, you need to recognize that Jesus feeds his people through what he fed his apostles. This means that you need to prioritize learning scripture and doctrine. He's a, this is a friendly reminder, obviously, at a seminary. You guys know this already. But it's worth saying, you're not here simply to check a box so that you can qualify for a ministry position. You've got an amazing faculty here who are feeding you. Eat it up. Store it up. Because you're going to need it when you need to turn around and feed other people. Learning scripture and doctrine isn't a hobby for super nerds. It's basic nutrition for all of Christ's sheep. And so you, in your seminary journey, you're here to learn 
so that you can turn around and feed Christ's sheep in his church. I'm sure some of you here aren't students, so what does this mean for you? Maybe just friends, supporters. Even if you're never going to be a teacher or a preacher or a minister, you still have an important role to play in making sure that Christ's sheep are well fed. So what gifts, what opportunities has God uniquely given to you to make sure that Christ's sheep are well fed? Maybe it's through your own personal discipleship and your life in the church. Or maybe it's simply encouraging your staff at church. Important thing to do. And maybe it's simply through financial support of institutions that are existing to feed the sheep like your local church. And of course, Phoenix Seminary, who serves the Southwest so well by raising up scholars and shepherds. True love for Jesus results in caring for Christ's flock. And that can take on different looks, but it's important for everyone who follows Jesus. Following Jesus, intending his flock. Well, right after Jesus recommissions Peter to ministry and he tells him what that ministry is, this is what you're to do, feeding the sheep, he gives him now a preview of what that ministry is going to look like. A fourth exhortation. Follow Jesus in spite of suffering. Let me just read 18 and 19 again to us. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you did not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. It's traditionally understood that Peter died under the Roman persecution of Christians in the mid-60s by crucifixion. If that's how Jesus told you that your ministry was going to end, how would that land on you? Peter's early life was going to be marked by freedom, but according to Jesus, his later life was going to be marked by captivity and crucifixion. That's what it means to have his hands stretched out, as we saw with Jesus in his crucifixion, the one who's crucified bears the cross beam on his back. He's wearing it as he walks to the place of crucifixion. Now certainly Peter again had a unique role here to play as an apostle, but the call for discipleship for each of us is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Most likely it's not going to be a literal cross like it was for Christ and for Peter, but as you follow Jesus, you will encounter suffering on your way to glory. It is unavoidable, it is inescapable. So there's a real question that you must ask and answer if you intend to follow Jesus in ministry. Here's the question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? You have to answer the question honestly for yourself, is this going to be worth it? Jesus said in John 12, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Do you see the eternal perspective that Christ is bringing to the calculus of this question? If the horizon of your perspective is only set on life in this world, then you might conclude, friends, that it is not worth it. If you think so much of your life in this world and so little of your life in the next, you might turn around when the going gets tough and the, the going is going to get tough. And so you have to ask yourself this question and answer it very genuinely. Is it worth it? As Peter reminds others later in life in 1 Peter 4, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as if something strange were happening to you. And this is the way that it works. What else would you expect when you follow a crucified Savior who tells you to take up your cross and follow him? Get ready for it. So this is a question that we need to settle in our hearts at the beginning of your 
pursuit of Christ, certainly. But maybe a question that you should consider and ask regularly, is the suffering I'm going to encounter for following Jesus worth it? Is it worth giving up my own freedom to bear the yoke of Christ? Is it worth losing relationships on those who are definitely going to turn their back on me? Is it worth giving up certain comforting habits, letting go of some of your addictions? Is it worth using your time in service of others, not selfishly, you're going to have less time for yourself? Brothers and sisters, you will only be able to spend this life for Jesus if you believe that he has gone to prepare a place for you in the next. A place without sin, without sorrow, without suffering, and you have to keep that last day in mind. And at that point, the only question that we're going to need to ask and answer will not be a hesitant, is it worth it? But the rhetorical, is he worthy? Worthy is the lamb who was slain. As Peter himself encourages us, 1 Peter 5, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore and confirm and strengthen and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Is he worthy? Yes which means everything that he calls you to and that you will go through in your pursuit of ministering as you follow after him will be worth it. We cannot avoid the brokenness of this world, but we can listen to the voice and hold the hand of our shepherd as he guides us through it. Because he has chosen a path for us and it is our duty and our delight to follow him wherever that path leads. A final exhortation. Fifth, follow Jesus in the path he assigns to you. Let me read verses 20 to 23. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the, the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus didn't say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So Jesus has invited Peter to follow him. That's what the last words were in the passage just before this, verse 19. And so now Jesus and Peter apparently have been going on a walk on the beach of Galilee. And John is following them, apparently at some distance. And when Peter hears this report about what the future of his ministry is going to look like and how it's going to end in captivity and crucifixion, he asks what I think is a fairly understandable question. He turns around and looks back at John. He says, what about that guy? What's your plan for him? What's the path that you've assigned to him? And Jesus responds, what's that to you? You follow me. Keep your focus and your attention on the path that I have assigned to you. Apparently, John wants to clear up a misconception that had raised here. It seems as if some were under the assumption that John was supposed to be alive at the time when Jesus returned but Jesus was simply making a hyperbolic statement to Peter. And what he was doing with this hyperbolic statement is he was telling him to concentrate on his own path and to not evaluate the path that he is on in light of the path that John might have. Peter and John both had unique paths to walk. They're both apostles, both disciples, but there was something unique. Uh, John was going to end up writing more of the New Testament he was a, more of a thinker and a writer. Peter was really more of a, a doer and a preacher. But that is none of Peter's concern. There were others who had enjoyed breakfast that morning with the resurrected Christ. There was quite a variety between those seven disciples that gathered there for that breakfast. 
You've got Peter, the public recurring failure. You've got Thomas, the one who disbelieved in the resurrection just before this in chapter 20. You've got Nathaniel, who at the beginning of this gospel wondered out loud if anything could come out of Jesus' hometown. You've got the sons of Zebedee, those guys who were jockeying with each other for positions of power within Jesus' kingdom. And then there's two other disciples that are mentioned at the beginning of this chapter that aren't even named. Uh, Two others, two other disciples. Uh, Lost to history, but remembered by Christ. Each of those unique individuals was given a unique path to walk by Jesus. And it would do them no good to spend time comparing and contrasting those paths with one another because they each had different gifts. They each had different abilities, different convictions, different weaknesses. And as they served Jesus, who put them into the positions that they were appropriate for them, they needed to be content to follow the path that was assigned to them. I never grew up anticipating being a pastor uh, really at all. Uh, It wasn't until later in life where my mind began to be drawn towards Christ and the things of the church uh, more than my, my day job. And during the time when I started to consider whether ministry was something I should do or not, uh, maybe if you had asked me 10 years ago, if Jesus has a path for me and I'm sort of anticipating what it looks like, it's probably that I'm gonna go back to my home church that I grew up at, back in the East Valley. My parents still go there. My grandma was a member there like in the 50s. It's in the East Valley. It makes a lot of sense. I have a great desire to go there I wanna make sure that that church is faithful to the gospel for another generation. But as God would have it, that was not the path that he had for me. He made it very evident by ending my other job and opening up uh, an opportunity to join the pastoral staff at Trinity Bible Church in 2019. And though it was hard to move my family from the East Valley to the West, it seemed clear that it was the path that Jesus had assigned to me. And then in the summer of 2022, when the opportunity came to serve as lead pastor, it seemed that it was the path that Jesus assigned to me. And it was about a year to the day after I had begun acting in my office as lead pastor at Trinity Bible Church, that the opportunity opened back up to be pastor at my old home church. And a brother named Cody has stepped in to fill that role He was actually recently installed as a lead pastor there a couple weeks ago. It was not on his radar to pastor that church. It was on my radar. But what is it to me where Jesus has Cody pastoring? It's really none of my concern. My responsibility is to follow Jesus on the path that he has assigned for me. My life is not the path that I would have chosen, but I want to be very clear, I am so grateful that the path has led me to Trinity because he knows where I need to be better than I do. It's like a general. Jesus moves his troops around on the battlefield to the exact places where they need to be at exactly the right time. And so friends, I know the temptation to jealousy about the paths that others were going to be taking as seminary wraps up. Some will be moving on to PhD studies or big popular churches, fancy new whatever. Whatever shape your ministry takes, whether that's missions or pastoring or counseling or discipleship or teaching, trust that Jesus knows where you need to be. Wherever that is, plug in and steward your time well. Do not be discontent where he's placed you. Spend your time well in growing obedience to Christ's word in response to his grace as you tend his flock in spite of the suffering because it is the path that he has assigned to you. And your good shepherd leads you each all the way. He knew you'd be here this evening to hear this passage 
And so what has he got for it in you? Are you willing to trust that he is guiding you that's on a path that might be better than you know? Are you willing to embrace the fact that your life is not entirely about your personal freedoms, but rather about your humble service? Here's a key takeaway from this passage. Follow Jesus as he equips you to follow the path he gives you. Follow Jesus as he equips you to follow the path he gives you. In these moments of your anxious doubts, which I know so well, your fears as you are preparing for ministry, remember how Jesus meets us in those very moments with his grace, with his provision, with his guidance. Let's keep here tonight, each walking forward with the assurance that with every step, Jesus will equip you to follow the path he gives you. Thanks be to God for our good and faithful shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I trust that your word and your spirit are at work here tonight. And I ask if there are areas of fear or anxiety or sin that need to be brought out, that you would bring that to mind that we would be willing to confess these things, to bring them to you, that you would give us a great encouragement about the fact that you are our general, placing us where we need to be, trusting that they've been put here in this institution to study and that you've got a path for them. And help us keep that final day in mind when we will know the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, face to face. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.